Okay, and we are live. Welcome back, everyone, to the Indie Music Academy, the channel where we uncover the mysteries of the music industry, learn how to grow a larger fan base, and earn income from our music. And today I have PR manager, uh, sync licensing expert, Jennifer Yeko. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, yes you got it right. Awesome. So lucky to have her with us today. She's going to uh, not only cover the basics of sync licensing, but also the five sync licensing avenues that you need to be aware of, how to approach and contact music supervisors. And we're also going to be taking your questions today, which makes it very special uh, because we are live streaming. I wanna encourage you to dive into the chat and just uh, say a quick hello, drop your name. We always love uh, knowing who's here with us by name. Uh, and this is your time, your time to learn, your time to ask questions and interact. And uh, with that, I would love to see you interact uh, in the chat right now, just so we can know who our audience is today. So uh, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Jennifer really quick, just in case someone is meeting you for the first time. Uh, can you just give a little uh, you know, two, three minute background uh, for what you do, uh, what you do in Los Angeles in the music industry, just so uh, we can catch people up who are meeting you for the first time? Sure, absolutely. So where do I start? I started out actually as an artist manager, managing bands, independent bands, shopping them for record deals. That was always very exciting, taking record label meetings. Um, so that was my background. I've spent many years as an artist manager, still have a management company, although I haven't found anyone. It's quite the next Taylor Swift yet, but I'm still looking. Yeah. Um, and then I got through management, I got into doing music licensing. So that was mm. I mean, this is going to date me, but this is around 2000, 2001, 2003. So that was just kind of in its infancy of people getting their music license as independent artists. It wasn't really as common as it is back then as it is now. So I spent a lot of time as a manager pitching my artists and then kind of people wanted other music. So I started licensing other artists' music. Um, and then through doing that, I decided to spin off um, – a separate PR company so that I could help other managers and other artists that maybe had representation uh, do publicity. So mainly pitching like to film and TV, but obviously also doing some traditional press. So that's just kind of, I guess, my life in a nutshell <laughs> without going into too yeah. much detail. That's awesome. Yeah. So you ended up in this world of sync licensing. Now, um, there's probably a lot of people who know what that is and there might be a few people who have never heard of that before and so just to begin to catch people up uh, we won't spend too much time on this but uh, what exactly is music licensing if no one's heard of that before sure so i don't know if this will meet the legal definition but basically <laughs> music licensing is well actually there is, a, there is a lot of legality to it but basically you know when you're watching whether it's your favorite netflix show your favorite go to the movies and see a Marvel film, an ad, uh, play a video game, watch a movie trailer in the theaters or online. Obviously, whenever there's music in any of those avenues, um, someone has to license that music and obtain the rights to place that song into a TV show, a film, a trailer, an ad. Um, so there's a, there is a lot of legality to it because you can't just take... Um, you know, a song by the weekend and just put it in your independent film. You actually get in a lot of trouble if you do that. I know people get away with a lot of things online these days, but the reality of it is, you know, as you know, as artists, and many of you are probably our songwriters, um, you own the rights to your music. So um, you ha someone has to ask your permission before putting it into any type of uh, commercial project. Right. That makes a ton of sense. And a, a lot of us, uh, and by us, I mean the audience listening in, we're on YouTube right now. And we're, we might be, um, you know, we might be used to kind of the YouTube Wild West where we can just use anything we want and maybe our video will get taken down, maybe not. But outside of YouTube, in the real world of music and film and cinema and television, that can't happen at all. And uh, there is a process. And so that's what sync licensing is. Now, before we move on uh, to uh, the next question, I just want to uh, take a moment to recognize all the people watching. Uh, we got Miami in the building. How's it going? Roger Peterson in Orlando. Uh, do you guys know each other? You live kind of close. Uh, <laughs> Justin says, hey, Ryan. Uh, and hello, Jennifer. Hello from hello. Brazil. Hello. Hey, y'all. Love it, love it. And uh, hello, I'm from Barcelona, Spain. Hello from the Netherlands. 
Ohio wow. represent. Wonderful. If you guys are just joining in, I just saw uh, you know a, a fair amount of people just join in. Just to say hello. Um, this is what I said earlier. Uh, we love knowing you by name. So just drop a hello, say your name, say where you're from. We are taking questions today, and it's actually not too soon to drop your questions in the chat. We're going to do a Q&A time, first come, first serve. So if a question uh, arises, uh, either uh, write it down in your phone notepad or just throw it in the chat now so you don't forget. I want to really make sure that we get your questions in today. So uh, with that, I want to move on to the other introductory topic before we dive into the nitty gritty. Uh, we talked about music licensing. Now, there are individuals who actually uh, run the departments that choose the music for these uh, television shows and these, uh, these opportunities, basically. And they're called music supervisors. So I'd love for you to cover what is the definition of a music supervisor? Who are these people? Why do we talk about them all the time? Why are they important? Sure. So. Again, I'm not an attorney. I always feel like I need to figure out the legal terminology here. But Word. basically, in Perfect. layman's terms, uh, the music supervisor is the person that is choosing music for a project. Again, it could be uh, your favorite Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Apple TV show. Um, could be an ad. Could be a movie trailer, mm -hmm. a film, or a video game. Those are the main areas where music supervisors work. Um you know, gotcha. obviously if you create an independent film, you could also have a music supervisor and you really should. Um, but those are, you know, usually that's where the bulk of the money goes toward. That's where the bigger budgets are, certainly with advertising. And I think trailers get a lot of attention because, you know, everyone sees the new trailer when it comes out. So that's a big deal. So basically the music supervisor chooses the music for any of those, chooses the music for any of those projects. Right. And so a quick question about music supervisors specifically. These are not people necessarily in the music industry only. Their jobs are actually more film related. Is that accurate to say? Well, or is it about a 50-50 split? So each area is a little bit different. I mean, if you talk about, say, video games, there are video game publishers and they usually have mm. in-house music supervisors because constantly, mm. you know, EA, Activision, places like that are obviously creating a lot of games. So most big companies have in-house either music supervisors or music executives that are pretty much on staff. So whether it's Fox or ABC or Netflix or any of those big companies, all those companies, again, um, have music supervisors in-house. Um, advertising agencies typically did as well. I think a lot of those mm -hmm. people have um, that a lot of industries have consolidated. So, you know, you can either be in-house at a company like Disney, or you can be a third party kind of external uh, music supervisor. And a lot of those people are, I mean, it's probably the most common area because music supervisors can go from project to project, whether it's working on an ad or working on, you um, Again, a movie, especially in movies, because obviously movies, there's no consistency. I mean, yes, you can have an in-house supervisor at Sony Pictures, but um, a lot of music supervisors are self-employed or have their own companies or work at a small agency, you know, where they mm. um, work on different projects, depending on what their project is. But people tend to specialize, right? They tend to be known for either TV or doing the Marvel films or known for maybe a certain genre of music. Um, so it just kind of depends on the project. Gotcha. So it seems to me that there's two types of music supervisors. There's the ones that are on staff at a company, and then there are the free agents, so to speak. Yes. Okay. That That's makes a lot of sense. Fair generalization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I know. It, it's so hard to be specific in just a short amount of time that we have today. But um, I mean, honestly, we already appreciate uh, everything that you're sharing. So Okay, we learned about music licensing mm -hmm. overview and the music supervisors who are in charge of choosing the music. Now, what are the sync licensing paths? You already mentioned a couple. Like, I actually forgot about video games, but video games are huge, right? One of the hugest right. industries, bigger than the music and the film industry combined. Uh, and they need music too. Um, so, what are the possibilities as an artist, as a songwriter? What are the, the lanes? What are the sync licensing paths? You mean in terms of how to get your music license? Well, just uh, what are the avenues? What are the end places that your song can end up in? So we talked about television so far, um, video games and cinema, but there's a couple more. I think we mentioned trailers. Oh, there's one I'm missing. I'm trying to get to five. Oh, yeah. 
and a big, commercial. That TV is probably the biggest one just because of the volume of TV, not just network TV, but, you know, your mm. ABC or CBS's, NBC's, Fox, that type of thing. Okay. Then you've got Google, yeah. and then you've got obviously all the streaming platforms, but so TV can encompass a lot of different things, but traditionally it's okay. like broadcast and cable, and then you've got streaming platforms, then you've got, let's see, video games, films, mm -hmm. ads, trailers. I'd say those are probably the big five. Um, gotcha. So yeah, that's crazy. So you'd say that television and video games are probably the biggest segments of sync licensing? Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you define biggest. I don't know what the breakdown revenue wise is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think there are as many opportunities in games. I mean, there are, of course, there are mobile games too. There's lots of different types of games um, and apps even. But, you know, in terms of, I'd say, volume of music needed, it would probably be TV just because of the sheer volume. I mean, Netflix alone, I don't know how many shows are on Netflix. So. Yeah. Hundred billion shows coming out every day. So yeah, um, there's yeah. just a lot of volume there. Of course, there are a lot of games that come out, but I, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know if you would count all of the mobile games and I don't know as much about how much music they use, but I'd say just generally, and, you know, and obviously people have to have budgets. I mean, if you, you can license your music for free, but if you want to get paid, certainly you want to go somewhere where someone has a budget. So again, TV just right. historically um, has a bigger budget for, a larger volume of music than film where, you know, they release less and less movies, at least theatrically than every year. It seems like there's less and less movies coming out. And so sure, if you are the weekend and you get your song into a massive <laughs> film, I'm sure that payday is quite nice, but and for mm -hmm. the average person, it's very difficult to get a song into any type of a feature film, just because if it's set in space, they're not using a lot of, you know, music, right? It's all score, right? Most, most films tend to be hit, right. um, primarily score, which is instrumental music that a composer writes, you know, like a Hans Zimmer or someone like that, mm -hmm. or, Williams, mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, this, there's not as much source music unless it's just a heavy, heavy music oriented film. Right, like Gardens of the Galaxy or something like that. Sure. One Even, in a million yeah, films that's a is like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So television, because of the volume, because of the type of shows that are on television, definitely the, probably the most accessible uh, for an average musician who's looking to get into sync licensing. I think that makes a lot of sense. Sure. And just because of also the time frame, because on a film, I mean, you can spend, you know, months and years on a film so they can mm. choose many, many songs. They can listen to hundreds and thousands of songs and maybe still not find that perfect song versus TV where the week to week the deadlines are very short. So they can't be as particular about, OK, the song's good enough kind of to work. It's fine. It's not it doesn't have to be perfect. So, again, I think mm -hmm. it's just a lot easier to get into TV because they can't be as selective as maybe, again, you know, a film where they have nine months to choose the music for something, for a scene. Right. Yeah. That's huge, too. Yeah. And then going back to mobile games, I mean, I don't think I've ever heard a real song in an app or in, you know, in a mobile game. And uh, that seems to be mostly just work for hire stuff, right? The, the, the developer will just hire a composer or just get it off of some library. And so that's probably not a real opportunity there compared to television, right? It just depends if it's, you know, if it's a very popular, you know, if it's a very popular game with a big budget, then yes. But if it's something, and there are a lot of small app developers and that they're, you know, creating games in a studio of maybe 10 people. So, you know, I'm not as familiar with that. I don't usually pitch to those types of companies, but I'm sure that the, in a lot of those situations, yes, they're either writing, having to write, um, have a composer write cues for the game. You know, I'm not as familiar with the mobile side of things, but it's, it's, I'm guessing that a small app developer is not going to have the budget to license, you know, a Taylor Swift song or right. know, Olivia Rodrigo song. <laughs> right. Yeah. And actually, we should definitely uh, talk about that really quick before we move into the next category. But the budgets involved uh, that you just brought up, what what is that? Uh, what, what What's the ballpark of of uh what's the reward for getting your song in a television show like what is the upside to to doing all this work 
I mean, sure. I mean, certainly I think a lot of people do just want to be able to say their song was licensed. There was a certain mm -hmm. cachet uh, to being able to say that my song was used any by anyone. Um, so that sometimes is a reward in and of itself. Back in the day, MTV never really paid for songs or oftentimes didn't pay for independent mm -hmm. artists to license their songs. So mm -hmm. it's like, hey, you should be happy that your song is, you know, on an MTV show. But, you know, of course, there there can be decent upfront money um, for any of those projects. I mean, the budgets can range anywhere from gratis, which is basically you giving your music away for free, which is obviously not mm -hmm. ideal. But people say exposure, you know, um, yeah. you, you know, if you're a big, big artist, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, depending on what, you know, if you do a partnership with Microsoft and they want to use your song throughout a campaign throughout the world. I mean, obviously, something like that for big name artists could be millions of dollars. But you know, usually mm. the fees are relatively small. They've, I've seen budgets come down over the years. Um, it just it just depends on the project and what they have allocated for their music budget. Okay, so it seems to me I've said that a lot today, but this is a really complicated uh, uh, part of the industry. But the opportunities that are, you know, more exclusive, that are uh, far and few between, like cinema, a global ad campaign. Uh, for a major brand, those are the ones that really pay. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And then, and then the ones that are a little more common, like television, because television shows have lots of episodes. They rely on a lot of uh, music because of the the types of shows, right? They're all set in space, uh, as you said. Those will pay a little bit less, but those opportunities are easier to find. Is that kind of a good summary so far? Um... I mean, it's hard to generalize because it really does depend on, you know, a trailer for a big budget film is probably going to have a bigger budget than a trailer for a small indie film, generally speaking, unless it's part of a big studio and it won Sundance and then maybe it would have a bigger budget. So it's hard to really compare because they can be very, very different. You know, same with advertising. I mean, for sure. ads historically do pay very well just because your music's being used to sell a product. And so usually companies are willing to spend more money when it's, when it's that type of an ad trailers can be very lucrative but if it's a small trailer or for just a few seconds of a song it's not going to be millions of dollars there tv can be very lucrative if you have a volume or depending on the show and you get back-end performance royalties so it's really hard to just generally say because you can make a lot of money just doing tv and you know obviously you know video games i mean it could be any of them could or couldn't be lucrative depending on the project and what their budget mm -hmm. is you know there's not always rhyme and reason to even a network show, one show, if it's heavy music oriented, you know, mm -hmm. could be have a very good budget. And then a similar show on another net on this, even in the same network could have a very small music budget. Uh, yeah, no, that's a fantastic answer. Yeah, it really depends on the project itself and the show itself. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, how important okay. is music to that, you know, game? How important is music to that film, mm -hmm. to that, you know, obviously, like you said, at Guardians of the Galaxy, where music is so integral to the entire film, then obviously you would probably allocate a lot bigger of a budget than, you know, oh, we need a couple background source cues for this one scene where they're driving up a mountain and a, you know, indie, you know, small cable show. I mean, so it just, right. just depends. It just depends on the show and the network mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. what they've allocated for it right and then there's also the daytime shows and then prime time shows and their budgets are completely different as well and so a lot of people tuning in today are probably wondering like okay this is all pretty interesting like can my music be synced and, you know and uh, that's actually what I'm wondering myself and so what is the right type of music for sync licensing and what generally is the wrong type of music? Because I've heard this before that not every song is really created, um, you know, equal, basically not every song is ideal for getting synced. And so I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit. What's the right and the wrong type of song? Gosh, it's hard to really put into words. I was actually mentioning this to another artist yesterday. Mm -hmm. After you've listened to a lot of songs and you've received a lot of briefs and you've gotten a lot of music requests over you know, a couple decades, you just kind of get an ear for this works and this doesn't work. So it's very hard for me to say, this is a genre or this is a song that would work. It's kind of like you hear it and you go, yes, this is a very sync friendly song or no, that mm -hmm. song probably just isn't going to work. Um, mm -hmm. 
I mean, generally speaking, I think contemporary songs tend to do very well. You know, a lot of songs I hear can be kind of dated sounding. And while I know the 80s and 90s, like kind of retro stuff is very in, that's fine. But I think sometimes things have like an old fashioned it's hard to explain, but I hear a lot of music and it seems like the production can be very just not contemporary in its production. So that's hard to license. Um, mm -hmm. His song just sounds old fashioned in some way. Mm. Um, you know, I think songs that have a lot of instrumental beds can work really well because, you know, they don't want the music and the, the vocals to interfere with dialogue in a lot of instances. So you know, Coldplay was one of the most licensed bands, I think, for a long time because they just have these beautiful and, you know, they write great songs as well. But and also mm. the lyrics are kind of very vague. And so I think when you're writing about either universal themes or sort of what is the song about? Can we use it to sell, you know, uh, yeah. paper towels? I don't know. Yeah. And so, you know, when you have vague, uh, I was going to say vague themes, but when you have universal themes, um, they can just work very well for licensing. No, that's that's huge. Actually, I've, I've never thought of that, but yeah, just themes like happiness, right? Because that can work in a car commercial, paper towels. You know, you just want to sell happiness with your product, and so happy songs probably are going to be more syncable than depressing, uh, you know, sad, moody stuff. Sure, probably. but you don't want usually for people to be unless it's uh, you know they're selling a maybe a poignant uh, scene in for selling a diamond ring or something. But generally, people in mm -hmm. ads, I mean, most of the time they want either driving music because it's a car commercial or something upbeat and happy, right? People tend to buy products when they're in a good mood, probably not when they're sad <laughs> most of the time. So um, you know, I think that can work. But I think it's just I think one way to tell is just you know pay attention to the music that's being used in your favorite Netflix shows. And, you know, I mean, I listen to the radio cause I'm old, but like, you know, that's, is still a good barometer, I think in terms of what's popular. So I think just listening to Spotify, I think can be good, but there's so many songs that I think might do on Spotify that probably aren't going to get licensed. And so I think mm. just again, being in touch with obviously, you know, and I haven't heard Olivia Rodrigo songs be licensed yet, but I'm sure they're out there. But I think just, if you want to know what kind of songs are getting licensed, watch TV, listen to the music and the ads on TV yeah. or in the ads that when you're streaming a show, listen to the music when you're watching a Netflix show, a, a, your favorite movie, you know, a trailer, just like pay attention to the music that's being used and that'll give you some idea of what's licensable. Right, that's awesome. So good, so good. And uh, man, we have a lot of people who just joined. So I just wanna take a moment to say, uh, just welcome. We're, we're live. That's always uh, something that someone asks, like, is this live? Uh, can I type in the chat? Yes, you can. So um, we're going to do a Q&A time in just a little bit. We have one more topic that we just want to cover uh, just so we have a nice spread uh, on this topic before diving into your individual questions. But uh, keep the questions coming. There's already a lot of great ones that we will cover. And uh, if you just joined us, uh, go ahead and say hi, type your name. We love knowing who's here with us live. And uh, we're super lucky to have Jennifer here with us uh, answering seek licensing uh, questions. And so um, with that, uh, we talked a little bit about the right and the wrong music. That's probably an overgeneralization, but um, I, I wanna ask about uh, trailers really quick before we move on to the next topic, because I've seen trailers that have kind of a generic cinematic, just like orchestra hits and epicness and all, all that kind of stuff that does not have a song. Mm -hmm. And then there are the trailers that do use a song that everyone knows, but it's it's not quite the same. Like I think um, an example that I've seen recently was like a Nirvana song, but it wasn't you know the normal version. It was a very cinematic version of that. And so what is, what's going on there? Does the studio just license the the rights to the song and then just recreate it? And then what? What happens there for trailers? I mean, I think that trailers try to be pretty progressive in the music that they're using. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. There might be an instance where they say, yes, we want to redo a different version of a Nirvana song and put it in this trailer. Mm -hmm. um, usually companies are usually behind that where whether they're, you know, a music library or just a sync placement company or just a manager with their artists where they'll say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we took 
you know, it's very popular to take an upbeat song and turn it into a ballad, you know, or take mm -hmm. a ballad and maybe make an up-tempo rock version of it or something, because it's a recognizable song, but then right. it's a different take on it. So it's kind of breaking new ground in some ways where it's familiar, so people will like it, but yet it's different, so it's new and fresh. So that just mm -hmm. tends to be a trend of not just doing a cover song that sounds like the original, but something that's a very unique version of it i think that's something mm -hmm. that's been going on for many years now and yeah. yes you don't have to pay for the master license if you just cover somebody's song they just have to pay for the publishing obviously the publisher whoever wrote that song or whoever owns the publishing so it could be you know sony atv or a different publishing company but they you know they you have you can't just cover a song right if you want to get it placed the publisher has to agree to license that version of the song. So you could cover a Coldplay song, but if, mm -hmm. you know, if their publisher doesn't approve it, you're not going to be able to license that song. So like, for example, there's mm -hmm. some, there's some artists that just historically don't license their music, you know, for anyone. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you cover that artist song, it would probably be hard to clear it. You know, I think that gotcha. one was one. I mean, there's a whole list of them, I think, if you look online. So you just have to be aware of if you've heard that uh, that song covered before, that's probably a good indication that it's licensable. But again, there are just some artists that, um, you know, I'm assuming like a Taylor Swift would probably not want other versions of her songs out there because her brand is so iconic. So you just have to be mm -hmm. aware of what what artists are uh, and what publishers are OK with their songs being covered. Gotcha. Yeah. And then there's there's the flip side of that, too where an artist can create their own version of a public domain song mm -hmm. and hopefully get that synced. Like the example that I'm thinking of, there's a great artist here in Nashville named Mark Sibelia, and he covered This Land Is Your Land oh. and it got in a Jeep commercial uh -huh. uh, for the Super Bowl. And obviously Jeep, you know, it's like a perfect fit. And because that is in public domain, at least I'm assuming it is, um, and he created the master that was perfectly syncable and he uh, was rewarded as if he wrote the song pretty, pretty sure. Is that how it works? Um, I mean, it's not that you get rewarded. I, you know, I forget what the time limit is on that for public domain songs, but they tend to be mm -hmm. older classics. I think after, don't quote me on this, but I think it's something like 70 years, you can have a copyright mm -hmm. on a song or a hundred mm -hmm. years, something like that, then becomes public domain, but you can look it up and see. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not that the song becomes yours. It just means that then they don't have to go like my previous example, where you'd have to, if you want to cover a song by the weekend, you'd have to go to that publisher or if they own their publishing, that artist to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, that they, someone has to clear the master and publishing on any license. So if it's public domain, nobody has to clear the publishing. And since you're creating an original master, you can pretty much just create that. So it's, it's a smart way yeah. to mm -hmm. create music. But again, songs in the public domain aren't going to be the songs that historically get licensed a lot because people want whatever the new hot songs, you know, like again, yeah. Olivia Rodrigo, I'm sure everybody wants to license her music now because it's so popular. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good way to do it, but you know, you have to find a, a a version of a public domain song and make it contemporary enough or interesting enough that someone would mm -hmm. want to listen to it. Right. Yeah. Not very many like, opportunities there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, one last question uh, that I know everyone here is wondering. We talked about music supervisors, how they uh, are the ones that choose the music that go into the television shows, into the films, into the ad campaigns. Uh, how do you start meeting music supervisors? Great question. I mean, I can tell you how I did it. I don't know how people do it when they're starting out now, probably a lot of reaching out to people online, but I live in Los Angeles. So when I first kind of got into this business, I, there were a lot of different panels and events that you could go to. Obviously, you should have to pay and sign up and go um, I went to South by Southwest, you know, there's CMJ mm -hmm. and there are all these different music conferences as well. But in L.A., they would just put on these panels and they'll usually have, you know, three to five music supervisors. Sometimes it's a luncheon. Sometimes it's just an event um, or a music conference. And so you'll just go uh, and listen to the panel. And then afterwards, you go up to the people and, you know, talk to them, see if you can get their business card or contact them on LinkedIn or something like that. But um, it's tough. I mean, I spent many, many, many years doing that. Um, and so it is hard to develop those relationships with people. So i um, not sure what the best way to do it now is because I know for most people, they 
don't want to be reached out to on Facebook or in certain certain social media mm -hmm. because unless it is just a business page for the company, people obviously want their Instagram or their, you know, Snap to probably be private. So it's they don't want to be hit up on Facebook for right. you know things like that. Um, I don't know how people feel about LinkedIn. I mean, that's a little bit more professional, but I don't add you know musicians generally to my LinkedIn. So. I mean, to me, it's like you should just maybe find the person and find their company and see if you can just email them. And that's usually the best way to go about it. Some people might tweet yeah. out um, contact information, but I would say probably just honestly a blind emails or a random email is better than, you know, any other way that I can think of. I used to call right. people. I used to just mm -hmm. pick up the phone and call. That can go over well, but it takes years to get people to even talk to you and so if you haven't met them at a conference or had some someone introduce you like a friend of a friend knows somebody um i you know honestly the sort of the blind email is probably just the best way to sort of introduce yourself and keep it brief you know just like hi i'm so and so i'm from baton rouge or i'm from spain or you know or wherever you're from i think it's interesting especially i see people from brazil and all around the world in this chat but you know mention maybe a little bit about yourself keep it brief you know send links to your socials and just like a link to the music to check out you know like a disco right. or soundcloud or a spotify link but just keep it really really brief because you have to keep in mind that a music supervisor can get I know at one point someone told me they got a thousand emails a day and this was a long time ago. So I don't even want to know <laughs> how many emails wow. people get. But just keep that in mind. You know, if you don't hear back from someone, they might be getting literally hundreds or thousands of emails a day or a week. There's just a lot of people yeah. doing this. So just be friendly, be genuine, be uh, authentic. And again, just try to pick like your best, I'd say a few songs, don't send them a link to everything you've ever written. Or, you know, I don't know if everyone needs like the snap Insta, Facebook, like, you don't know, just try to keep it yeah. simple. Like, here's a link to my music. This is where I'm from. If you've had any other placements or anything that's been interesting, that makes you maybe want to do, oh, I have, you know, 300,000 followers on Spotify, or I have this many followers on Instagram, or this many streams, anything that's mm -hmm. notoriety for them. But Try to keep it brief and just send your best material. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, with a thousand emails in an inbox a day, it's there's just not a chance of getting noticed. So it seems that if you can somehow meet them in person at a conference and have some kind of spark and connection that gives a window of time where maybe they will look for your email, you know, it's like met in person. Hey, I'm going to email you tonight. And you have that window to make it happen. That seems like probably the best way. Um, if you never meet them or never have any kind of introduction or any kind of any reason to reach out to begin with, then you can just get lost in the mix. It seems like more often than not. So uh, I really love what you said about conferences. And, and even though there's probably a ton of people at conferences, as well, um, if you do have a conversation, I feel like it can increase your chances of that email getting read by a thousand fold, really, sure. if they're looking if for that email. Met, we met at South by Southwest or we met mm -hmm. at some concert or something. And certainly, you know, of course, yeah. you know, this is not a time where there's probably a lot of that going on. Um, you know, I do mm -hmm. think that showing you've done research on people, you're not just, you know, if you're someone you're reaching out to someone and they are, you know, trying to think of an example, like say they work as a video game supervisor and you're pitching them singer songwriter mellow stuff. Like there might be an opportunity somewhere, you know, in the right game or something like that. I don't know. Like, but you know, like if they're working on Fortnite and you've got mellow stuff, I mean, you have to just keep in yeah. mind, like do your research in terms of like, what do these people work on? Look up their credits. You know, obviously if you can personalize and say, Oh, I was watching this Netflix show and I love the song you used in the scene. You can really personalize it and say, you really like, a project that they worked on or that you've yeah. done the research to know that these are the types of projects. Oh, I see you music supervised this show and I have music that's very similar to what was licensed in that show. Or I know you like this type of music, just show that you've done your research on people. So, because there's so right. many music supervisors, they work on so many different projects. And if you're sending something to someone that historically works on like Marvel films, but it's, you know, classical jazz. I mean, maybe there's an instance where they could use that, but you know, you have to really, research, you can look it up on IMDb and online, you can just see what types of projects someone has supervised to know mm -hmm. that if it's the kind of music that you make and see if that's Absolutely. a oftentimes it's it's not. So just make sure you, you know, a blind submission is just a blind submission. But when you show you've actually researched somebody that makes a big difference. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And also uh, not only researching what they've done, but if you can somehow figure out what their current projects are, that seems like a huge advantage too, because yeah. something that someone once told me is that music supervisors, they're just trying to get their job done in the, in the best way possible, right? They, they're working too, and they don't necessarily want to be bombarded with a thousand emails during the work day because that's creating more work. But if you can somehow make their day easier and know what project they're working on and say, hey, I might have the perfect song for your current project, here it is, then you're not adding to the workload, you're subtracting from the workload. And I've, I've always remembered that tip and I thought of this just so, um, it's like a dumb moment, but it's so smart too, uh, to think of it that way and uh, to not think of it so selfishly, but what can I give and how can I help rather than to just throw my music against the wall, even if it's not a match. So um, that's uh, something that I've been told and hopefully that helps anyone listening in today. So with that being said, I'd love to shift into a Q and A time if that's cool with you, Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to read the chat as I'm doing this. <laughs> it looks like there's a lot yeah. of good questions and comments there. Yeah, and uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who's just joined in. We're gonna uh, take your questions now. And uh, so if you haven't uh, typed out your question yet, if you have a burning question that you want to ask, now's the time, drop it in the chat. I'm gonna scroll all the way back uh, so we don't miss anyone from the beginning. Uh, but I, I know that, um, that I saw a few, here we go. Uh, let's get started. Yeah, and uh, feel free to, uh, to ask uh, pretty much anything regarding uh, sync licensing. Does that work with you, Jennifer? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, this is a great question about uh, libraries. So I'm a singer and songwriter who also likes to compose instrumental film music, film soundtrack inspired. Would you recommend me to be with a music library or just stick to one sync agency? That's an interesting question, I think. A great question. Um, but we didn't really talk about music libraries. So for anyone that doesn't know, I guess you can think of a regular library, but music libraries basically are companies where they collect a lot of songs and, um, and then they pitch those songs as a collective work. So. Um, oftentimes music libraries can be just more affordable music so because they might just say, oh, I just need, again, a, something to play in the elevator, this one movie or something to play in the background of this one scene. And so it's, you know, there's a lot of music li libraries. They've been around for many mm -hmm. decades. And I think that there's just been a massive proliferation of more music libraries. So yeah. It's a great question. It's kind of hard to answer. I think everyone's situation is different. I think there are some really good libraries out there that do really have time and believe in certain artists. Um, I mean, I come from a different perspective where I've worked so closely with a small number of artists being a manager where I have one client or four clients at a time. And so I was pitching them. And then even when I've had kind of my own music not really a library, but just a list of artists that I would reach out to. It was always very small. I think my concern with music libraries is that A, there's so many of them and B, mm. there's so much music and it could be, I mean, it could be someone that has, you know, a couple hundred artists. It could be a music library that has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of songs. And what is your chance of getting a song somewhere if you are literally one, even 10 songs among 300,000 songs, the odds are very slim that they're going to somehow, someone's going to fish out your song. That being said, over the years, I've heard from artists that have songs in libraries that their songs have been picked up for a major spot for a Macy's ad or a big commercial or some cool opportunity. So it just depends. I'm personally not a fan of them just because I feel like the chances of you just getting lost are very, very high. And oftentimes a lot of these libraries can be exclusive. And that means they're the only ones allowed to pitch and represent your music, which generally is probably not what you want to do. Um, so mm. of course, because I've been on the pitching side, I think it's much better if either you can pitch your own music or you can find someone, you know, that can pitch it for you um, yeah. as opposed to putting into library. It's kind of like buying a lottery ticket. You could win the lottery. Chances are you're not going to, you're probably better off going to college, getting a job, getting some skill, learning software engineering, you know, doing something that's a little bit more helpful to you than just hoping that you win the lottery. But people win the lottery. It's just yeah. not, not, not a good 
long-term plan, right? And so I would mm -hmm. say if you can have a sync agent that really believes in your music and not someone that just says, oh yeah, I believe in it just to get you to sign something, you know, and tr maybe try it out for a little period of time. Or again, if you give someone a shot, maybe give them one to three songs, maybe not your best songs, just give them a few in your catalog and see if they can do anything. And if they're able to get some interest, then you can maybe consider giving them more. But I just think it really depends on the library or the sync agent, because there's great libraries and there's not, and there's libraries that are just too big or just not, not good at what they do and then there's great sync agents and there's people that aren't so good so again you really just have to do your research and make sure that someone isn't just telling you oh yeah your music's great and then you're not just dropped in with another three hundred thousand songs yeah which is you know just as good as i don't know having it on a dropbox really if it's never going to be seen <laughs> Right. I mean, it's much better if you can pitch pitch or have someone pitch your music to supervisors directly. That's just going to be your best bet, I think, generally speaking. And you're also going to get the most money for those songs because you are a special artist as opposed to, oh, you're just a generic instrumental, you know, guitar track or something like that. It's it's mm -hmm. from a branding perspective. Again, I'm coming out from being a manager, being a publicist, pitching artists myself. But I just think you're better off you know, branding yourself as someone unique and special as opposed to someone that has songs in a library. But again, if you've written some instrumental tracks that don't have anything going on with them and you throw them in the library and you weren't doing anything with them anyway, can't hurt. It's just, you know, it's better to have someone branding you specifically, right? As opposed to just being a generic artist Absolutely. in your genre. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Nuria Gonzalez says, thanks for answering the question. Yeah, um, great answer. Um, actually, this is a great segue to the next question. Um, what do managers look for in artists before they manage them? Because you mentioned it's better to have someone, some individual backing your music rather than being thrown into a library. So what would you say uh, to an artist who's probably wondering the same thing? How do I get Jennifer's attention? <laughs> Sure. Um, if you if you want to email me, uh, I can send you. I wrote I've written several articles about this. I think there are like twenty different things that I look for. But mm -hmm. um, I would say, I mean, work ethic is basically one of the most important things. I think a lot of people rely, and I used to rely upon talent and great songs. And certainly, I wouldn't manage someone without great songs. But the reality is, if you're a hard worker, even if your songs are just kind of okay right now, you'll make them better and eventually they'll get to be great and you'll become mm -hmm. a successful artist. But if someone just relies and rests on their laurels of being talented but not doing the work, and believe me, I've worked with a lot of people like that, um, they're just not going to go anywhere. Your talent would have to be, you know, like Taylor Swift is successful, not just because she writes good songs, but like when you read things, interviews, she's like, she can't, she comes to every session, even now, like completely prepared with fully formed songs. I I mean, there's just there's just a work ethic there that I don't think that you see unless you even watch some of the music documentaries, like the, even the Katy Perry, Justin Bieber movies, or even there's a one called "It's Chasing Happiness" or something about the Jonas Brothers. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of the Jonas Brothers, but that movie is an amazing movie. Like that first documentary they did, I think there's two out, but the first one particularly shows the work ethic and how many times they were turned down and how broke they were and how they were helping support their parents. I mean, the work ethic of artists, even though you may or may not like them, if you really dig deep down into how they got to where they are, yeah, maybe they had some advantages, but they have worked so hard. So I think the work ethic is to me really the most and almost the only important thing. Yeah, I mean, if you can't sing, it's a problem, right? A lot of people think they can really sing. And it's like, you know, you look at the Beatles, or you look at, you know, my favorite band, Keen, it's like the lead singer, you know, the the keyboardist, like writes all the songs, basically is the main songwriter, but he's not a great singer. So then he has someone else sing the song. So I think you have to know yeah. your strengths as an artist and realize maybe you're a great songwriter, but maybe you don't sound like, you know, you know, name your favorite artist. I mean, maybe you don't have the vocals of a of a big hit artist, but maybe you can find a singer to sing your song. So I think it's recognizing where your talents are, if you really are a singer, or if you really are a songwriter, or if you're really a producer. I knew another guy, he was in a band, very talented, but his strength was producing. And he went on to become a very successful music producer for big artists. Unfortunately, his music career never took off in terms of his own band. So I think you just have to be willing to maybe recognize that your strengths may be, maybe it's in management, you know, maybe it's being an agent or doing online social media promotions, but, you know, really hone in on what your strengths are because it's hard to be 
the songwriter, the singer, the music producer, the manager, you know, but you have a better head for business, you know? So just be honest with yourself and really be honest about where your strengths lie and hone in on those. But yeah, work ethic is like absolutely number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. And uh, I just saw they also said th thank you in the chat. So they really appreciate the time. Sure. Okay, next question. And this uh, this actually, this question came up a few times. Uh, so I'm gonna group a bunch together because a lot of you asked this, but uh, what are some of your favorite sync companies? And it seems uh, uh, that a lot of the audience is outside the US or maybe even a company that does international uh, work, an international agency. Um, honestly, you know, I. I don't really know if I can name favorite sync companies. I mean, I've, I've pitched music myself. So of course I would say myself, but you know, I, I'd say again, it's just about doing your research and, you know, even with me, I mean, most of my contacts are in the U S so I don't do a lot internationally. So unfortunately I can't answer the question in terms of who has the best international reach. I would say, you know, just do your research and, you know, do as much Googling as you can about companies. And if you know someone that's had, look at maybe an artist that's getting a lot of placements and see who represents them. Mm, Again, right. oftentimes, even with the best sync agent, you're only as good as your musician. So I'm only as good as you, a sync agent's uh, company is only as good as the music that's being provided to them. So, you know, if you gave me like a hit artist or a good artist, like I could open up every single door and I have, but you know, I know all the right people, but if you give me music that isn't placeable, it doesn't matter who I know, I'm not gonna be able to license it. So again, right. you can look at where songs are getting, you know, if you see an artist that's doing well, who represents them, maybe that's one way to find out, especially if they're independent and they've had some success yeah. with the licensing side, but, um, you know, I, I think yeah. it's just about doing research and making sure you're not just signing up with the company because they said you're great. It's like, oh, do they really have a good reputation? Have you gotten referrals from other artists that have been successful? Again, doing mm -hmm. that research I think is really important. I can't really name anyone off the top of my head that I would say, yes, they're absolutely, because for any, for That's one okay. client, they're amazing. And another client, they might not have done anything. So it really just mm. depends on, on the music. At the end of the day, if you have good music, yeah you will get interest, you will get placements. If it's, if it's syncable, like you will do well. It's just, but you have to have syncable music. Mm -hmm. This is a, a really similar question, spinoff almost. Are there free sites where music supervisors list the type of music and songs they're looking for? Are there sites that make you pay to submit to music supervisors? Uh, are they, are those legit? What can you uh, say? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say without knowing which sites you're talking about. I think that music supervisors generally don't list um, what they're looking for because a lot of times it can be confidential. I mean, like mm. I did a tip sheet and still have done a tip sheet for many, many years, but it's a small list that it goes out to. So, you know, usually artists I was managing or artists that were kind of participating in that. So yeah, I would say generally most music supervisors aren't going to list that because they already have their resources. They can go to major and independent record labels, major and independent publishers. They are already in touch with, you know, managers and artists themselves and music libraries and companies that they like. So I would say, you know, if anything, maybe if you can get in touch with a music supervisor, ask them if they work with any sync agents that they like, and then maybe that's one place to start. But it's really hard to say um, in terms of the legit legitimacy of, other tip sheets. I mean, I know mine was real, but I can't speak to, I think there are some very real tip sheets, but and I'm mm -hmm. sure there are ones that aren't, you again, have to do your research, but again, you're kind of in that mode of, again, of being one of whether it's 20 other songs that are being pitched or 200 or 2000 other songs. Right. There's just a lot of people out there doing it. So anything you can do to develop relationships directly, like I've spent, you know, almost two decades at this point, establishing those relationships, um, Mm -hmm. And so it's just hard to kind of come into that newly. So I would say, you know, they can be good, but you'd have to research them. And I'd say, generally speaking, it's just then you're even if they like your song and forward it, you are then one song of, you know, however many. I met with right. an agency in New York years ago and they said to me, I pitched them, you know, oh, we need the song for this ad. I had the brief. It was confidential. But I looked at it and I sent them a song that I thought was a really, really good fit for this commercial. 
Mm -hmm. I went to his office and he's like, see all these other songs. And he just scrolled. It was like pages and iTunes of pages pages of songs. He's like, you need 10 more like this to even stand a chance at it. So while it's not about, Mm -hmm. it should be about quality over quantity. But again, your songs are up against every artist signed to every major label, every major publisher, every indie label, every indie publisher, and everyone basically, you know, that 60,000 songs being uploaded to Spotify every day. There's a lot of competition out there. So your Mm -hmm. music has to be not just good or great it has to be pretty amazing you know to work and then of course you know they just have other opportunities and if they can license like a lizzo song or a weekend song for a commercial they're probably going to because it has name recognition so you're up against that aspect of it so it's just about i think the product at the end of the day if you write incredible songs then you will have a lot more opportunities but the music has to be just as great as you can make it i mean Mm -hmm. That's the best, most important part. Who's representing yeah. you? I mean, yeah, legitimate people that have good contacts. But at the end of the day, you can only do so much with those contacts. You have to have great music. It has to be pretty phenomenal to get licensed. It's very competitive. You know, you yeah. have a TV show, there might be only like one or two source cues where they're like playing the radio somewhere or they're in a scene where they even need music. So you are literally up against, you know, the Rolling Stones or, you know, Olivia Rodrigo or name any artist. I mean, you're literally up against, you know, you know, Machine Gun Kelly. I mean, it's they, yeah. they oftentimes will and can license big artists still. So it's very difficult. So I would say you just have to make your music as good as you can make it. That's fantastic advice. And honestly, it's it's the truth, even though it might be an uncomfortable truth. It's it, you have to just play your best hand all the time, uh, whether it's sync licensing, trying to uh land a manager land a label deal whatever it is it's i mean there's no way around the truth that your music needs to be fantastic um so i'm so glad that you just said it without um just cutting corners and saying it how it is you know um we have a lot more questions i'm going to actually uh ring the 10 minute warning bell because i like to keep these things to a crisp hour uh as to not waste our our uh guest time which is so valuable and already uh, I know so many are so thankful for you spending time with us today. So uh, thank you uh, once again. And uh, before we jump into the final few questions, get them in the chat if you have one in your mind and you need to uh, to get it down. Uh, but real quick, I just want to bring your attention to a few things that are going on at the Indie Music Academy. For one, uh, if you're a fan of this channel and if this uh, live stream has helped you in any way, I just want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss another live stream like this one. Uh, All we want to do is just bring information and value uh, to help you with your music career. So if you're not subscribed yet, go ahead and click that button. It really helps the channel. And then also, I want to bring your attention to the free marketing workshop that is in the description of this video. The marketing workshop is designed to give you free, uh, actionable help regarding um, marketing your music as an independent musician. So this is a three video workshop where I talk about um, just kind of the first steps that you should do as an artist to begin thinking about your marketing plan. If you're working uh, on marketing for the first time, it's gonna be a great first step. And if you've been marketing your music for a while, uh, just remember that this is an ever evolving industry. And so it would be good to also refresh on uh, the latest uh, trends and strategies. So that link is in the description below. I also have a link to my 8020 Music Business Crash Course, which is a 30 day, or I should say four week uh, course where every single day I give you a lesson and action steps on how to get your music career set up from the very beginning. So if you're interested in that, that link is also in the description below. Uh, Wow, I did that mostly without mistakes. Uh, We're gonna get back to your questions. Uh, Get them in the chat. Uh, We have uh, just a few minutes left, but I wanna make sure that we uh, try to get as many questions as possible. So let's bring up the next one. Try to do a flash round. I can try to be brief. (laughs) That's right, let's do it, let's do it. Thanks for all the Uh, comments. I'm reading all the comments, so thanks for all the comments there. Oh yeah. Yeah, thanks for being so engaged today. It really just makes our, our time more fun as presenters. OK, uh, one more question. Do I need to get work for hire agreements going for from the dozens of musicians on my songs if I want to pitch for sync? That's a great question, I think. I mean, yes. 
I mean, ideally, yes. I mean, chances are hopefully people won't uh, do something shady, but absolutely someone, you know, I've been in that situation managing artists where someone's like, but I played drums on that track and shouldn't I get a cut of it even though I didn't write any of the song? I mean, yes, absolutely. If you are not in a band where you have a band agreement and if you're in a band, you should definitely have a band agreement, um, mm -hmm. but absolutely have, you know, work for hire agreements. That way that's very clear that you pay, especially if you paid the people, you know, because then you've already outlaid the money there, but yes, you absolutely need to get work for hire agreements so that if you do get that placement, when you do get that placement, you don't have to have worry about someone coming back and saying, wait, you told me I could have 10% of the song or I own half the song, or you definitely need work for hire agreements. So yes. Yeah. That's so yeah. wise. Yeah. Great question. Uh, just a quick spin off question. If there's an artist on a budget, uh, maybe they had their friends collaborate. Is it um, <laughs> is it ethical or uh, standard to write up a work for hire agreement where the payment is like zero dollars or Domino's Pizza or I'll help you with your song? What does that look like if there is no cash exchange? Well, I'm not an attorney, but again, I keep mentioning that because so much of, le of, of music licensing is doing legal clearance. So it's like everyone's mm. a paralegal or, or um, an attorney in many ways when they're a music supervisor because it's all about rights to songs so it, there has to be some type of exchange you can't have a contract there has to be some consideration so you can't say you did this in exchange for zero dollars it has to be mm -hmm. in exchange for a dollar that's why you'll see those contracts to say a dollar or i guess mm -hmm. you could do it as a pizza i'm not really sure you have to ask a little about the pizza better to give them a dollar than say well i only got a pizza it wasn't paid as is anything so but some consideration some exchange has to be made so uh, usually that's mm -hmm. why a contract say a dollar but um yeah. yeah i mean i would say either that or you know something on the back end you can always say okay you know i don't have money to pay you right now i can pay you a dollar if you're okay with a dollar but um but if you know if i do make any money in the future but that's really giving them the rights to the song or deferred payment again these are like legal mm -hmm. questions so i would say best to ask a, a, an attorney i don't want to say i'm attorney because i'm not so i would say right. uh, totally questions for an attorney but you know of course if you can you know defer some type of payment or offer them a percentage of the song if you wanted to as payment or you know some other arrangement you know i'll make you dinner if you plan the song i mean i but again yeah. it's a question for an attorney how that would really be structured if someone's doing you a favor mm -hmm. and i do believe people should be paid for their work so even though they're not the songwriters, maybe it would just make sense to pay them, you know, X number of dollars. Like if I make that much money, like if the song makes this much money, then I will give you whatever that agreed upon sum is. Right. So yeah, just give them a cut or pay them the hundred bucks. It's much better to do that rather than just saying, Hey, you work on my song and I'll work on yours. And it's kind of an un, uh, documented trade that can really get fishy, huh? If it's just on this kind of trade uh, situation where nothing is written down and there's no paperwork, huh? I mean, I think you can probably barter, but you probably would have to put a contract, you know, that would mm -hmm. say that I'm doing this for free and I don't own any rights. We're just exchanging. And if it's that kind of handshake mm -hmm. agreement, I mean, again, I. Yeah. I think you're an attorney, everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I did go to law school, so questions for for an attorney for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's so wise. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can defer really money. You can say, if I make money, I will pay you the hundred dollars or the four hundred dollars or whatever it is later, whatever that may be. I mean, but mm -hmm. yeah, try to get things in writing to clear to just to make it clear that someone because I have had situations where someone in a band said, Oh yeah, we're cool, we agree to split the song this way, and then this placements came along, they wanted more money. I've had bands break up because of a sync placement where they were literally making the same amount of money. So it didn't make sense to me. So people hmm. do strange things as soon as money gets involved. So if you can make sure that you have everything in writing, and, you know, uh, it's just better. So you don't encounter someone trying to, people get funny about money. It's just how it is. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. just, if you can have things in writing, it's just better. So you don't have that problem down the road because God forbid you make money from your music. <laughs> Someone will come along and want a piece of it. So um, yeah. it's just to hammer that all out up front. So. Yeah. And then really quick before we close the book on this, how would uh, independent artists go about finding a great attorney? Like what, I wouldn't even know how to start if it wasn't for my wife who uh, actually went to uh, went to school, got her master's degrees and her professors were attorneys. So that's how I met many uh, individuals. But for someone who doesn't have that story, uh, how would someone 
uh, just meet a great music industry lawyer? I mean, I'm trying to think how I found people in the beginning. I mean, there are directories that are published, like Music Connection always mm -hmm. has one of the year. I mean, it's hard to really know. When I was shopping a band for a record deal, we would take meetings and, you mm -hmm. know, we kind of went on the vibe and I guess how their office was and how they treated us in the meeting and obviously who their other clients were, who they represented. So in LA, I mean, they're, you know, they're, there's some good attorneys or some kind of shady attorneys. You have to be careful like anything. But again, checking references. Certainly, if you know a band that's maybe one level up from you and they have someone they work with that's that they can, you know, recommend that's um, been reputable for them, that's a good place to start references. But um, I think, again, it's just doing your research and and just, you know, seeing if they have other references and also just going off of asking good questions and trying to evaluate them when you have a conversation or a meeting. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there's codes of ethics. There's, they obviously have to adhere to certain things as an attorney, but um, you know, I've just known people over the years that I've met from again, conferences and events where you're like, Oh, this person seems like they're smart and they know their stuff. You have to be a good judge of character in the music business. So while sometimes I'm wrong about that, generally, I think you have to be able to judge when you see someone, if they're being honest or not, but people can be different. So you just have to like, I took a class once where the person in the teaching this class was very kind of one way in class. And then when we met in his office, he was a completely different person. And I'm like, which person mm -hmm. are you? Are you kind of showy kind of full of bravado guy that's kind of full of himself? Or are you this nice down to earth person? Like, which is the real you? And so that's concerning yeah. when someone isn't consistent in their behavior, then I'm like, I don't think I would work with this person because I don't know which they were polar opposites. Which person are you? So I think you just yeah. have to the judge a character in this business and not just be naive and trusting people, but do your research, ask for references, and then ask good questions and look for inconsistencies in their actions and behavior, you know? That's wonderful advice. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Um, great question uh, that just came in. I heard that music supervisors won't consider direct approaches from composers. Uh, is that generally true that they'd rather get, uh, you know, uh, an email from another manager rather than directly from the artist or from a label rep or what's the situation and, there? I mean, it's, it's a, Interesting question. I mean, it depends on the music supervisor. I'm sure some music supervisors, if they're working on a new project or show, might be able to recommend or involved in choosing composers. Oftentimes, though, they aren't. Sometimes that's just the composer for a film is often hired by the studio or the producer of the film or the TV show or something like that. So it depends on if they even have any influence. Again, mm -hmm. some music supervisors will accept unsolicited material. Many of them probably mm -hmm. won't. They've gone to a level where they don't have time or don't want to go dealing with artists when they can deal with people like me, third party, you know, music sync agents, things of that nature. So I think that's kind of a gross generalization to say that they won't accept direct approaches because yes, you can't approach a label without a manager, but are there workarounds to that? Probably, you know, they will talk to you if you don't have a manager, but it's certainly better to have one. So I think it yeah. just depends if you're getting pushback, um, you know, it's just tough because I've represented composers over the years and it is very difficult because you were literally, I mean, I've sat in meetings with the heads of music at studios and saying, yeah, and for our next film, we're going to hire Hans Zimmer. So I'd love to consider your composer, but, you know, we have a certain amount of budget. We have all these investors, you know, it's, it's, you can't just kind of get, it's hard to get into I think it's much easier to get a song license than it is to get a job as a composer. You know, the, oftentimes mm. that's a very um, competitive world. And there's a lot of people graduating from great programs all around the world that moved to LA or that are working and it's, and there's only so many, of course there's a lot of Netflix shows now, but there's only so many projects that need composers too. Um, and so you're just, it's very competitive. So I wouldn't say that they don't accept direct approaches. It just depends, but keep in mind that a lot of music supervisors have no influence on what composer gets hired for a show An independent film, maybe, but again, Chances are, if the person went to film school, they have 30 friends that are music composers, right? That or, you know, yeah. or musicians now. Of course, now bands, you know, big artists that obviously like the Trent Reznor's of the world, obviously big artists are composers now too. So you're up against musicians that have all turned to composing as another way to make money. Music editors, mm -hmm. my friend's a music editor, and now he's composed music for one of his shows. Just one, one episode, but still, I mean, it's very competitive. So I would just say, make sure you're reaching out to the right person. I think you're probably more likely to get traction from an independent film production company or a director, producer, 
up and coming, you know, if you could find the next, you know, uh, I don't know, Steven Spielberg before he's Steven Spielberg and get in yeah. as his composer, that's what you want. You know, Martin Scorsese, like I think, you know, his music editor, they went to film school together or no, his um, his film editor. And so they've been working yeah. together on yeah. films uh, since film school. So obviously if you can get in with people before they become known, you know, at film festivals or, you know, in film school or reaching out to those people that are just starting their careers, like that's a much better, I think, avenue at least on the mm -hmm. film side and probably even on the TV and other side, um, music supervisors just may or may not have a, a lot of influence. And even if they do, they already have so many people. So unless that music supervisor is brand new and it's like your best friend from college, da, 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 it's just really um, difficult. So I would say, look at other avenues. You know, you can definitely try music supervisors because some of them do have influence, but definitely try other avenues besides them because mm. I think they have a small amount of influence even when they are involved in that process. Yeah, that's so good. At the end of the day, they're all just people who have friends and uh, it's about Next building relationships. <laughs> I worked for, that's I can't say the celebrity, but I had a celebrity that I worked for when I, when I was just starting out in this business. And, you know, um, she was a famous actress, but, you know, you know, who, we had stacks of screenplays, right? This is when I thought I wanted to work in film. And so stacks, like a, like, bookshelves full of screenplays you know who's screen we got calls from agents all day long you know whose script got read first not the agent from you know caa or uta or any of the big talent agencies it was the next door neighbor because you know she was gonna run into him on a walk or something He's like what about my screenplay what do you think so um <laughs> be the next door neighbor to someone that's doing something because, you know, even, you know, and they wanted passing on it, but uh, at the end of the day, but still that's something like who, you Not know, read. Yeah. Or is, you want to maintain a good relationship. Yeah. I gave it to the head of development. Sorry. It wasn't really what we're looking for. That's how things get read, you know, not just the agents calling with big, uh, le you know, three, three letter initials behind their, their name. It was literally mm -hmm. her next door neighbor. So, Keep that in mind. It's all who you know. <laughs> Move next that door to so That's my good. best piece of advice for life in the music business. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, make friends. That is, that's been pretty much the recurring theme over every one of these streams. Um, yeah, I don't think it could be uh, reinforced enough that you just need to become friends with people. Be excellent at your craft. Meet people. Be an amazing person, a friendly person, outgoing. And people just want to work with their friends. They want to work with the people that they enjoy and like, uh, because we all know what it's like working with that jerk that uh, is not enjoyable and the days are super long. <laughs> so that is kind of the theme uh, of, of the music industry, of ev every industry, honestly. So uh, with that, we are actually out of time the fastest hour ever uh thank you jennifer so much for giving your wisdom your advice uh, on this topic i know that everyone uh enjoyed it we, we have uh, so many uh thank you notes in the chat uh christopher says it's been very helpful thank you both uh we got uh thanks for the great interview uh thank you uh from uh, another jennifer and thanks Thanks, Jennifer, from Jennifer, <laughs> and uh, it's just an awesome time. I just want to remind everyone who is uh, still watching uh, to join the free marketing workshop below. Um, that's a free gift for you uh, just as a subscriber to the Indie Music Academy. And if you're not yet a subscriber, uh, just uh, you can start now. Oh, wow, I didn't know I can put double notifications. That's awesome. <laughs> not intentional. Um, Click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss another video from the Indie Music Academy. All we want to do is just bring uh, music industry tips and help you with your music. And so hitting subscribe helps the channel uh, in, uh, in one of the most easy and fun ways. So with that, uh, everyone, just please uh, just drop a, a, a warm and uh, a, a loud thank you to Jennifer. Uh, she's been so awesome. And, uh, and we definitely want to have uh, amazing guests like her in the future. So uh, say thanks, uh, show your appreciation. Uh, we're glad that you're here. And with that, we are going to end this stream. Uh, stay tuned for the future streams on the channel and uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button. So thank you again, Jennifer, for your time. Yeah, I really you. appreciate it personally as well. So with that, uh, everyone, best of luck with your music and we'll see you in a future video on this channel. Take care. Bye everybody.